Well, hello, everyone. Pastor Corey back with another episode in our podcast series together. And we're going to be kind of discussing kind of the similar topic to what we talked about last week. And last week, if, if you had tuned in, we talked about the issue of homosexuality. And I did that because, as many of you know, June is Pride Month. So I don't want to we don't need to rehash that topic, but understand that that homosexuality is a sin. And the, the there was a comment made on my video last week uh, by Dan Serber, and Dan Serber had brought up that you know how could Paul talk against a homosexual relationship, and he said that Paul himself was in a same sex relationship with Jesus, and so I wanted to kind of discuss this ish, this this topic because what what Dan said is not something that exclusively he believes. This is a very common critique that is leveled against Christianity. You know, when Christians come out and say homosexuality is a sin, often those who oppose that will say, well, how can the, how can homosexuality be a sin when the Bible talks about us being married to Christ? And, you know, many members of the church are Christian. And so how can they be married to Christ? And and so, you know, as, as Dan said, how can Paul talk against it? If, if we're married to Christ, how can how can Paul uh, talk about, you know, homosexuality being a sin? But it, it, again, as we started last week, and I'll read again, the Bible makes it very clear that homosexuality is a sin. And I'm not saying this to, you know, pick on homosexuality. I just, this is the, the, the common ground we're going to start on. And it is a sin like any other sin. It can be forgiven. And all you have to do is turn to Jesus and ask for that forgiveness. But it says in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, it says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abu are abusive or cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And so that's very clear black and white. And for the church to teach anything but that, for the church to look at a, a person in an LGBTQ plus lifestyle and tell them that they're okay and they don't need to change, they are not only lying, but they are, they are, they are not loving on that person because the church is refusing to tell them the truth, which is if you persist in that lifestyle, you will go to hell. And so that, that's the message of Paul. Paul's very clear on this. Christ is very clear on this. The Bible is very clear on this. And so, Dan, to kind of answer your question, Dan, as again, as Dan had brought up this idea of, of us being uh, married with Christ. And I would just kind of want to echo what uh, Jimmy McConnell, he had, he had commented on, on Dan's comment, and he did a wonderful job explaining it. But I just wanted to kind of bring, bring this up uh, for discussion because, again, this is a, a very common critique. People will say, well, how can the Bible be against homosexuality when we're in a same-sex relationship with Christ? And there are there are different verses they, they use. Um, that The truth of the matter is the Bible does say the church is the bride of Christ. I am not denying that at all. I proudly say uh, you know, we are the bride of Christ. Uh, one of the most powerful places they, they turn to is in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, where Paul says, says, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. And then he goes on to say, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. And so Paul says very clear here. He says, I promised you to Christ as, as a pure bride. And there are many, many other places. You know, Revelation talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll look at Ephesians where it talks about us being the bride of Christ. And so that's not something I'm denying. And so, yes, Paul was the bride of Christ. I am the bride of Christ. Yes, everyone who's ever been in the church is the bride of Christ. And when I say in the church, I mean, you know, accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Anyone who's passed on or anyone who is still in the church and, and accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior, they are the bride of Christ. The church as a whole collectively makes up the bride of Christ. But understand that it is not a, it is not a physical marriage. I mean, it's very clear that, and I can say very clearly, I am not physically married to Christ. I am spiritually married in a sense, and, and my my spiritual relationship to Christ is that of a husband or a wife to her husband. But what you see, the Bible, when the Bible talks about the church being married to Christ, they're not it's not talking about a physical union. It's not talking about us being physically married to Christ, because for one simple reason, the Bible tells us over and over again. In fact, you can turn to Genesis. The Bible tells us in Genesis, in Genesis 1. He talked when he, well, I'm sorry, not Genesis 1, Genesis 2, where he talks about his, where he talks about the creation of Adam and Eve and the creation of marriage. Uh, 
in Genesis 2, it, it talks about a man leaving his mother and father and cleaving to his wife. Genesis 2, verse 24 says, This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one, the two becoming one flesh. And then Jesus says very clearly what God has brought together, let no one tear, us, let no one tear apart. And so if we were physically married to Christ, then that would mean anyone who's married to uh, on, or an a, a earthly spouse would be committing adultery against Christ. So that, that, that again, the, and the Bible talks about us getting married. In fact, Paul says, you know, stay single unless you, unless you burn with passion and get married. And so this, so Paul encourages us to get married. The Bible encourages Christians to get married. And so that reveals very clearly that since the Bible is encouraging us to get married to, to others, that we are not physically married to Christ because again we're not committing adultery against Christ. The, the thing that we need to look at is the fact that it's a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. So Dan, your comment your comment was making it a physical union with Christ. No, it is a spiritual union with Christ. The Bible is using the idea of marriage to reveal the type of relationship the church is to have with Christ. And people will ask, well why? Why is the Bible you, why does the Bible use this the marriage as this as this determining relationship? Why does the Bible use marriage to show the relationship we have? And the, the simple fact is is because marriage in the, the relationship of, of, a mar of a married couple was something that was very well known in Israel's day and it's still very well known in our day. Though I will say it's become skewed a lot and this idea of what constitutes a marriage has become skewed a lot. But in Israel's day, marriage was a very, very big thing, a very, very rigid thing and they knew very clearly the relationship a wife was supposed to have with her husband and vice versa. And so God and Paul went through God or I mean, God through Paul, I should say not Paul through God. God through Paul was using the relationship with a marriage, something people understood very well, to reveal and, and to help them learn about a relationship they did not understand very well. Their, their relationship they were supposed to have with God. You know, God, the relationship we have with God is not something that's so clear cut, especially for a new Christian uh, and a new believer, is because, you know, you might never have had a relationship with God. So you're not, you don't really know what that looks like. And so what Paul is doing is Paul's trying to make it easy. Paul's trying to say, hey, you know how a husband and wife relate to each other? That's how it's supposed to be with you in Christ. And so it's using something you're familiar with and something you know to help you to help you understand the type of relationship you were supposed to have with God. You know, God is God is is using a relationship again that we're familiar with. And so God, the kind of the example I can give you today is this this, you know, we, we in the workplace you often hear phrases like work wife or work husband. And we use these phrases a lot to describe people who are close in, in the workplace, people who, who act like husband and wife in the workplace. But when you say phrases like work husband and work wife, do you really mean they're physically married? Of course not. You're just using that to explain their relationship. It's the same thing when, when the Bible says that we are the bride of Christ. Does that mean we're actually physically married to Christ? Of course not. Because A, then Christ would have many, many spouses. And that's that's something that's talked about in something the scripture says not to do. So like like the phrases work wife and work husband, the, the term that you know the church as the bride of Christ is just it's it's something used to explain our relationship with Christ. We're not physically married to him. And again, it's using something that people understood to help them learn something about. What they didn't understand so well, their relationship with God. And so, so understand that, that the, the relationship we have with Christ is kind of like a marriage relationship. And I'll give you one very big example. The Bible says over and over again, we are to not have other gods. In fact, the Bible talks against idols in many, many places. Uh, since we're already in Genesis, if you turn to Leviticus, in Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19 verse 4 says, Do not put your trust in idols or make metal images of God for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. So since we are in a relationship with God, since you know we have become the bride of Christ, that's why the Bible talks against idolatry, you know, serving other gods. In fact, that's that explains why the Bible likens idolatry, worshiping of other gods, to adultery, which is having you know an extramarital affair. It's uh, to, to serve other gods is to commit adultery against God because, again, our relationship with Christ is likened to a marriage. And so 
You know, when, when people say, well, well, God's just being too restrictive and, you know, this idea of I can't worship other gods. And I've heard people say, well, God's just being too restrictive. But when you put it in terms of like a marriage, God is not being too restrictive. God is literally just having the basic expectations of any healthy relationship. And that is, you know, you won't you won't cheat on God. So God is not being too restrictive when he says, serve me alone. God is just literally laying down the basic standard that we expect from our spouses. That, that, that they will not cheat on us. And so, and, and Paul gets into this idea of being the bride of Christ of, in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 is, is where, kind of where it's talked about the most and where it's most famous and kind of the best teaching for it. So we'll turn, let's turn to Ephesians 5 and we'll spend some time here. And uh, if you know your scriptures, especially wives, they, they tend to cringe when they hear Ephesians 5 because this is where it talks about, you know, wives submitting to your husbands. So I'm not going to get too much into this whole idea of submittance right here and now because that's a whole different, a whole different uh, thing, a whole different teaching series. Understand the Bible is very big on male headship, and so when it talks about submitting to your husband, it, it, I mean it means that that the Bible is, is the man is the head of the house, uh, regardless of what society teaches, regardless of how we feel. The Bible makes that very clear. But again, I don't want to get into that too much here because the, our main point today is, is is not going to be male headship. It's, it's talking about us as the bride of Christ. But it does say, you know, in, in, in verse 22 of Ephesians 5, For wives, this, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For your husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. The church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. So again, the 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 relationship with Christ, he is the husband, and we as the church, we are to submit to him as wives submit to their husbands. And so the, the so the example of, that this brings is, you know, our relationship to Christ is like a, a wife's relationship to our to her husband. And it says for husbands, this means to love your wife just as Christ loves the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean and washed her by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own body. For a man who loves his wife is actually showing love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds it and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. So again, Paul using the relation the, the marriage relationship to talk about Christ. And that's, you know, one of the biggest things a, a marriage serve. A Christian marriage, one of the biggest purposes it serves is, yes, having children is a big purpose, but the, the one of the other big purposes that marriage serves is it reveals the relationship that God has with his church. So your marriage, if, if you are Christian and you're married, your marriage should be a testimony to how Christ cares and loves for the church. So if you have a, if you have a, a rough marriage or a rocky marriage, that, that's, that's where it creates issues because, you know, you want other people to, to look and, and to, um, you want your marriage to be a witness for Christ. And so that's why, you know, the Bible talks over and over again about, about a, the good Christian marriage because that's what this world needs. And so you need to ensure, you, in a, you guys in a Christian marriage, you need to ensure that you are you doing your Christian duty of being the godly witnesses. And if they're, you know, if you're not, then, then we need to, you know, you should, you should, work on how to have that relationship because your your marriage reveals the relationship that Christ has with his church and you want to make sure that other people are seeing that in a good light but again I, I digress we'll get kind of get back on the topic here the the idea of of we we are the bride of Christ and and we are so again that means that for for our sake for a spiritual standpoint we're not talking about physical we're talking about a spiritual standpoint Christ is our spiritual groom, and we are his bride. And so this should come as a great comfort for you. And that means here and now, as we live, we must be a we must be a faithful church. We cannot, you know, cheat on God. We cannot go serve other gods, even if you know we've made ourselves a god. We cannot do that. We need to serve the Lord alone. And the wonderful, the wonderful thing, and we're not going to get into it here because that would be a whole other episode. But the wonderful thing about the Jewish marriage is um, the Jewish wedding ceremony and everything they do in their wedding ceremony is a perfect relation and a perfect example of what Christ has done for us. You know, just uh, we'll kind of get into it just a little bit here. 
uh, the, the Jewish wedding ceremony was a little, it's a lot different from how we do have today. Uh, first, uh, they, there was an engagement. You know, the man would go to the woman and ask her to marry him, and she would agree. And there, what, it wasn't so much, you know, and then, it, then after she agreed, he would, you know, he would come to her father and he would ask her just, you know, he would ask the father to kind of set a price, uh, kind of like a dowry to be paid because, you know, for the wife, to, the wife, when they, she got married, she would leave the husband and, or she would leave the father and go live with the husband and you know be, build that family the father would lose a, a, a helper around the house a source of income around the house and so there was a price set a price to be paid for that lost income so you know so in order for the husband in order for the groom to get his bride he had to pay a price well who paid our price it was christ on the cross so just as the the spouse was to pay a price for the bride christ paid the price for us and then immediately after the price was paid, they were engaged, but there wasn't an official wedding ceremony yet. The, the, the son would go and, or the groom would go and go back to the father's house and begin building a place for his wife. Just as Christ left, you know, Christ says in, in the book of John that I go to prepare a place for you. So he went up to heaven to prepare a place for us just as the man leaves, you know, he's engaged and, and, Understand, the, it's not like our engagement. When you were engaged in the in the Jewish culture, you were as good as married. The only the only difference between you being engaged and you being married is you have not yet consummated your relationship. But you are still expected to be faithful to one another. You are still expected to to act as husband and wife. But as a, as immediately after they're engaged, they leave. The, the 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 husband, the groom leaves and goes to the father's house to build a place for uh, for his bride, just as Christ left. To build a place for us and then when everything is ready the father the father's the one who tells the son go get your bride go bring her home go bring her back and that's because the father decides when everything's ready for the bride just as the the bible says in matthew that christ doesn't know when he's coming back only the father knows because that's the father who determines that but the when the son comes back it is a huge parade that he comes and gets his bride and brings her home and they have what is known as the marriage supper of the lamb and so in the same way you and i when christ comes back to get us and he is coming back i promise you that he we will get to be a part of those of us who believe in christ those of us who know him as lord and savior we will get to be a part of this marriage supper of the lamb and it says in revelation 19 verses 6 to 9 it says then i heard what sounded like the sound of a vast crowd and a roar of a mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder praise the lord for the lord our god the almighty reigns let us be glad and rejoice let us give honor to him for the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb and his bride has prepared herself the bride is the church she's been given the finest of pure white linen for the linen represents the good deeds of god's holy people and the angel said to me write these down blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the lamb these words are true that come from god so yes we are the spiritual bride of christ we are not the physical bride. We're not physically in a physical relationship with him. We are in a spiritual relationship with him. And again, the 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 use of the term marriage to reveal our relationship to God really, really helped because again, the people of Israel, they had a firm understanding of what a relationship with your spouse looked like. They knew what that looked like. And for just think about it now, for new believers who've never had a relationship with God, it's very hard for them to relate. Well, how, how am I supposed to relate to God? You know, there's no precedent set up. There's nothing set up to show us how we ought to have a relationship with God. And so what does God do? God uses what, we, what the people are already familiar with. He uses the idea of a marriage to show them how we are to relate to God. But it, I, I, it's very important for us to know it's not that physical relationship. Paul was not in a physical homosexual relationship with God, Christ. Paul was uh, maintained Christian singleness his entire life. And he talks over and over again about the sin of homosexuality. And so for the critics to say, well, how could Paul talk bad about it when he was in that relationship? That is just built on a faulty understanding of the word of God. And so what we need to understand is, yes, I proudly say I am the bride of Christ. 
but it is not a physical relationship. It is a spiritual one. And I am, I am this, the church is the spiritual bride of Christ. And that is our relationship to him. And so we need to, we need to be the faithful, the faithful wife. We need to be devoted to Christ. We need to make sure that he is the only one we are serving, the only one we are worshiping because anything else, if, if we have divided attention, it means we are committing idolatry and adultery against God. So I pray that you are looking forward to this marriage supper of the Lamb. And again, I know I did kind of an overview of the Jewish wedding ceremony. If you ever have time, I encourage you. And, and I'm going to be teaching on it at some point here. The, the Jewish wedding ceremony is a beautiful ceremony. Part of what I do in my marriage counseling with people is I'll, I'll go over the Jewish wedding ceremony because everything about the Jewish wedding ceremony perfectly reveals Christ's relationship to us. And that to me is just a, just a wonderful testimony to who God is. I mean, God uses this, this, this idea of a wedding ceremony and literally everything they do in the wedding ceremony, which is not in the Bible. That's just something they came up with. They, you know, their culture came up with, yet God used every element that they use, every element that they do, every, every ceremony, every symbolism in the wedding to perfectly reveal what Christ has done for us in the relationship we have with Christ. So yes, we are the bride of Christ, and, and the wonderful thing about being the bride of Christ, it means that when he comes back for us, we will share in that marriage supper of the Lamb. So I want to end with saying Maranatha, which means come Lord Jesus. Amen.